is the main question. How can, how can contemporary housing, uh, like the bourgeois villa, be an experimental device, despite the ethical issues that, while present at all scales of architecture, are more acute at the scales of housing and planning? In 2008, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City sought to mediate the discrepancy between the object house and housing through an exhibition on prefabrication. Home delivery, fabricating the modern dwelling, included both a historical analysis of prefabricated housing in the modern era and five full-scale contemporary houses which were constructed in an empty lot adjacent to the museum. The effort explicitly referred uh, to several 20th century exhibitions at the moment that included either full-scale houses in the museum sculpture gardens, such as Marcel Borders in 1949, or extensive surveys of significant houses, such as the Unprivate House exhibition in 1999. Uh, at the same time, uh, the exhibition fully acknowledged a shift in the role of housing in the past decade. Unlike the name brand trophy houses exalted in the Unprivate House in 1999, the houses and home delivery provoke questions pertaining to how domestic dwellings may inform the scale of housing, specifically in reference to the appropriation of progressive technologies and the evolution of contemporary living practices and customs. Each house in the exhibition, for example, is understood as a unit in a potential housing development. The tone of the discussion has clearly changed. The object house is no longer valid as an isolated object, but rather only as a unit within a larger context. Unfortunately, the projects in the exhibition are also portrayed as isolated object houses in the landscape, and these romantic renderings weaken the argument of the exhibition as they demonstrate an unease with the diminished importance of the traditional object house and a reluctance toward the full embrace of housing as a discourse worthy of MoMA. An even more re recent exhibition at MoMA foregoes the scale of the house altogether, but also indicates a design-minded unease with the scale of housing. Foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream is inspired by the findings of the Buell Hypothesis, which was developed at Columbia University in New York City. A hypothesis states, quote, change the dream and you change the city, unquote. In other words, the dream of the conventional suburban house hampers the evolution of residential built environments, and it is therefore necessary to inspire a new dream of high density domesticity to bring the urban into the suburban. Each of the five firms invited to participate in the exhibition engages in experimental design practices, yet each collaborated with housing and other specialists so that the proposals go beyond experimental high design and address logistical and technical matters of large scale development. Which design firms typically, uh, I mean, which design firms rarely engage. Similar to the experimental object houses of the 20th century, these projects have built future possibilities and inspired debates on aesthetic and technological concerns of the built environment. The scale of housing, however, raises ethical issues concerning the imposition of design theory in the public. While relevant to the object house in terms of an ar architect's ethical responsibility to his or her client, the scale of housing amplifies these issues. Considering that the sites of the projects in this exhibition are towns that have been especially devastated by the ongoing foreclosure crisis in the United States, these theoretical conjectures by name brand architects have been interpreted as patronizing. Uh, this is not the first time that MoMA has created a controversy with an exhibition in regards to style. Its very first architecture show in 1932, the international style, erased the social context of European modernism and promoted it merely as a formal approach. In the foreclosed show, the qualifications of the firms were questioned and there seemed to be an overemphasis on high design. Meanwhile, com community-based housing and urban design organizations, which operate in both theoretical and practical manners, are conspicuously absent from the exhibition and the discussion as a whole. These organizations typically resist the showy representational conventions that museums and publications tend to favor, but the substance of, the work, of their work matches, if not exceeds, the depth of the proposals that were on display in MoMA. Despite the integration of multiple consultants into the design teams, and the relative collective nature of design firms, the MoMA show on foreclosure upholds the paradigm of architecture as a heroic profession of master designers. A recent proposal for a housing development in New York City, ADAPT NYC, underscores the challenges of implementing, as opposed to theorizing, the experimental housing agenda. Residential units in the project would measure between 250 and 350 square feet, about 23 to 32 square meters, which is significantly smaller than the current minimum that was established in 1987 under vastly different economic and demographic conditions. New York City's population is expected to grow dramatically in the coming decades in ways that do not adhere to conventional demographics. Uh, fortunately, multiple government agencies and Mayor Michael Bloomberg have agreed to waive the laws that regulate maximum site density and minimum unit size. This is a rare instance in the United States of public sector leadership in housing design. The architectural competition for ADAPT NYC even includes an opportunity for designers to propose further changes to zoning and housing laws. And other major cities in the U.S. are considering comparable law changes. 
The public, however, is somewhat divided on the issue, and the announcement of the proposal sparked a storm of discussion and controversy. In the U.S., at least, the housing boom in the past decade has created an unrealistic and unsustainable culture of comfortable living. Even in large cities, the development of excessively large units has satisfied unrealistic desires and created inflating expectations for space. In New York, for example, the, the market for 4,000 square foot lots has plummeted because these units are somehow perceived as too small. The same effect is seen in other areas of the market, so there's a trickle-down effect. Meanwhile, many news articles on the ADAPT NYC proposal conjured the images of the overcrowded pre-housing pre code apartments in immigrant neighborhoods of the 19th century, which were famously documented by Jacob Rees and how the other half lives. The implication of this press is that high density and small unit sizes are a sign of social degradation. The challenge of ADAPT NYC and, and similar proposals is therefore twofold. To overturn outdated laws that fail to address the demographic realities of, of the contemporary city and to sway public opinion. Uh, so turning back to the 1920s, uh, architects, urban planners, and community-based organizations may be wise to study this era as a way to stimulate new rhetorical and practical understandings of housing. The parallels between the contemporary era and the 1920s are significant. In both eras, an explosion in architectural technology inspired designers to rethink building practices and to overturn aesthetic and social conventions. Meanwhile, developments in communication in the public sphere led to uh, a reconsideration of labor and social practices as well as, not surprisingly, the nature of domesticity. Uh, we just heard a case of that. Um, in addition, a housing crisis in both er existed in both eras, albeit in different ways. During the housing crisis of the 1920s, overcrowding and crumbly housing stocks plagued European metropolises in, in a manner that was impossible to ignore. Modernists seized on these conditions as a vehicle through which to propose and sometimes implement radical changes to the design professions. The current housing crisis is perhaps less palpable both in the streets and in the public consciousness, as the detriments of suburban sprawl and climate change are somewhat slow to materialize, and at least for the moment, easy to ignore, although the recent storm in New York will hopefully make it less easy to ignore. The impact of the global economic crisis on the housing stock is similarly isolated from today's sanitized urban centers, that unlike those in the 19, 1920s are not bearing the brunt of the crisis. Over the past 30 years, many, many cities, at least in the U.S., but I believe elsewhere as well, have become much better looking, but not necessarily better functioning. The importance of tourism and business investment has led cities to sweep their problems under the carpet. In New York, for example, the visibility of homelessness has declined dramatically, but the problem itself has not. Exhibitions at MoMA and academic research studios may address the current crises, but the nature of engagement is relatively isolated as compared to the climate of the 1920s. Fortunately, contemporary architecture and urban planning seem to be emerging from an era of designer museums and cultural institutions, and the 1920s provides us with an inspirational, albeit impossible to replicate model of how we might initiate a new era of engagement. The Wiesenhof estate in Stuttgart demonstrates the relative agility of designers in the 1920s to navigate multiple scales with the same degree of vision and autonomy. Mies van der Rohe, an architect as opposed to a planner, designed the master plan of a full-scale housing exhibition, and the participants were primarily architects who were established villa designers. It was assumed that the scales of the house and housing were mutually inclusive. The same is not necessarily true today, which is perhaps why the MoMA exhibitions are so timid in comparison to the full-scale and long-term experimentation on display at Wiesenhof. While not exactly the solution to the problem of the European metropolis in the 1920s, the housing state which must, was much closer uh, to the problems of the European metropolis in the 1920s. Um, sorry was much closer to the actual problems in today's discourse. The scale and complexity of the contemporary city are far more daunting to today's architects, I believe, than the modern city was um, to modern architects. Um, so in the written version of my paper, I, I discussed three figures, uh, Luc Corbusier, Hans Polzig, and Hans Richter, who engage in an experimental housing discourse in different ways. Uh, here for the sake of time, I just want to raise one issue in the case of Luc Corbusier, uh, which is especially important to me as it is, um, and it is it's, that's a sometimes tenuous relationship between a designer's ethical responsibility and his or her designer to design creatively. Uh, the point I want to make, of course, is that these are not conflicting ideas. Um, and I cite uh, Luca Brucia's theory of the architectural promenade uh, as an example. Uh, his idea of this phenomenon begins, begins with an analysis of an urban phenomenon. It then gets developed more fully through the design of several bourgeois villas, and then re-enters the scale of the city in a transformed way through a housing project in Geneva, and ultimately through the development of the unites. Throughout these exchanges between scales, Corbusier in no way separates his social and creative energies. He uses wealthy clients to explore an idea of space that he was unable to realize at the scale of the city, where it truly belonged. He then applied the lessons of the villas to richen his early and unbuilt housing ideas, and to develop them into large-scale built housing schemes that, 
though often copied or rarely matched. Uh, this is because a cursory look at these projects suggests that they are based on symmetry and repetition, but they are in fact based on subtle asymmetries, inversions, and transformative iterations, all of which derive from his attempts to explore urban ideas in his bourgeois villas. Um, so just very briefly, this is um, Caruso's adoption of Choisy's analysis of the Acropolis, in which he's interested in, in these calculated asymmetries and unevenness in section. Um, he references this in his book Toward an Architecture in, in a section on the, um, on the sort of um, energy of urban fabrics, of vernacular urban fabrics. Um, his early housing schemes appear very sort of regular and symmetrical, but in these housing units there is actually some sectional complexity that begins to learn from the Acropolis. Uh, he then goes into these built works, these villa designs, um, which is where he really deploys the architectural promenade, even though it was originally an urban idea. Um, and then he redeploys this idea in the Emile um, de Clarté in Geneva, which you know I don't have time to explain it now, but um, it's explained somewhat in my paper in the, in the book. Uh, it's extremely, it looks like it's sort of just a normal slab building, but has an incredible sectional um, and planimetric complexity that makes it sort of almost impossible to understand without, without thorough analysis. And for me, this is a direct result of his work with the idea of the architectural promenade uh, in the villas. And then the unite, again, is this um, often copied, but you know, often misunderstood as a, just a repetitive modular design, when in fact there are a number of asymmetrical inversions um, and a whole series of, of, of sectional richnesses that um, sort of belie the, uh, the block-like exterior. And so for me, this is just a, uh, one example of this play between scales and this um, work between theory and practice that I'm not sure exactly how we can learn from it, but I think that this climate of the 1920s is something that we would be wise to revisit and to um, analyze more closely. Thank you. And we have recently graduated from the Architecture School of the Arsene University in Saloniki. And our presentation is based uh, on our dissertation. Here we will examine on one hand the theoretical approach of Derek de Gerkel, and on the other hand an interesting example of user architect interaction, how six, and designed by Peter Eisen. To begin with, we would like to refer to Gerkov's theory as it is presented in the book Architecture of Intelligence. This theory is based on the interconnections and interactions of both physical space, digital space, and the space and cyberspace. These three spatial environments create a system that encloses all of the different levels of human action, affecting consequently the architectural discipline. Firstly, we will try to define physical space. It follows the principles of physics and is determined by its dimensions. These parameters not only designate human's metric size, but also specify their movement's limits. One of the first organized attempts at the management of constructed space was the Hippolamian system. According to Gerkov, Hippolamian was introduced as a principle of rationality, a principle which is translated into proportionality when it is applied to architecture. Next, mental space applies to both brain biological evolution and function and to the philosophical and psychological procedures. The bias of representation comes mostly from the need for the mind to comprehend what the body is involved in. Human's brain perceives the physical space's information through senses. Then three imaginative and uh, intellectual processes create a personalized internal image of the external constructed space. Thank you. 
και εγώ τη φάνη τη Everspace έτσι κολυμπέτει την πίχνα να υπάρχει την πλέκτη που είχε άλλε κάτω σπέσει, ο οποίο δεν υπάρχει, με φυσικά σπέσει, με μετα σπέσει. Υπουσέρε ότι σε θέλει να μην πει να ράμα του ειδήνη τη σπέσει. Φέρσκι, εγώ για εξάμεινο με δίκο, σε δύο σπέσει, φυσικά σπέσει. Εδώ είναι το πόδιμα. Electronic networks we have seen that are running for any specific interacts and rules. Furthermore, both networks are characterized by its order symmetry and by multiple interventions that result from the combination of direct and indirect processes. The common grounds between cyberspace and mental space are virtuality, infinity, and fluidity. In addition, the evolving management, visualization, and presentation, and dependent mechanisms and related information processing through senses. Kirchhoff uh, proposes a new kind of architecture, the connected architecture, and defines it, and defines, it, defines it as the architecture that supports the physical and mental interconnectivity of both and mind. Application of a connected architecture can be, uh, firstly, digital buildings, whether they are extensions of real or one or not. For example, the Guggenheim Museum, a virtual museum of classical architects, and that was a platform showcasing physical artworks, but connecting also the different uh, uh, Guggenheim museums worldwide. The second application, a more abstract one, could be programs platforms which involve users participation in order to create their space as a virtual reality game and the uh, various websites. At this point, we will analyze Peter Eisenhower's writings about how six as well as Susan Frank point of view. Construction of House 6 was completed in the summer of 1975. That period there were multiple theories concerning the perception of space. In this context, Pisa Eisenman is influenced by the current approaches considering architecture. He looks obviously for an architect's innovative or hybrid role. He opposes to the principles of modernism and plays of function in the late phase of humanism. House 6 concept grounds on the term habit. The residence is designed according to the user's needs. Eisenhower creates spaces that can host an activity. For instance, there is space on the ground floor dedicated to the living room or to the dining room. Similarly, on the first floor, there is a bed alcove and space for sleep. According to Eisenhower, House 6, in its original incarnation, was in the idea of inhabiting or habitation as habit. Moreover, in House 6, Eisenhower, attempts to differentiate the compositional procedure by using a cubical grid in a distinct way. The archetypal spatial relationships form several strategies and if inverted, they can create innovative ways of space conception and perception. Many critics consider that House 6 resembles the stick houses. However, Eisenhower proposes the inversion of dense center with horizontal layering to dense center with perpendicular layering. Eisenman also underlines that House 6 and the House 6, the facades and the walls are organized in the basics of points of reverence. Each element is edited in order to show its distinct meaning that is detached from function. What is more, a system of new spaces and rules applied to three dimensional grid constitutes the concept of the residence. Eisenman uses axonometric diagrams and projections and follows a series of transformational diagrammatic techniques. The produced spatial object is not the end result of the process, but more accurately, a regular process. The fragmentary character of the final formation of the structure by following cinematographic steps introduces a significant parameter, time. Eisenhower claims that despite the fact that all transformations do not reach an architectural result, architecture is based on the dialectic between real and virtual. Now we will continue with uh, the users as you can see the writing. Uh, one senior has one approach to uh, Arizona. Uh, they were very keen on his experimental spectrum architecture and the find house one. Uh, at the very beginning of the design process, Arizona asked them uh, to give him a list of uh, their everyday activities. And this uh, list uh, was specially transformed into uh, unbalanced closed call uh, that uh, contained all the situations, uh, the possible situation parts. Uh, France, uh, 
It contains a genetic code which presents at the same time the desired process and constructive result. The predefined relationship between the architect and the user is transformed into a cooperative and constantly negotiating relationship in architectural space. The constructive result is an insoluble consequence of the collaboration, which is based upon principles that protect and initiate the user's wills, as well as compose the early architectural space. The house in my set of tiny masks shaped by the sculptors, the architect and the users. The users are invited to read and perceive a game arranged by the architect and then manage it according to their personal needs. How six users participated in the formation of the house throughout the building history, in post construction. From the beginning of the design process, they track the way it blows and they intervene, modifying largely the produced space. How six is a result of a compositional process based on the interplay between the architect and the users. In this way, it is construction. Looks like a easy house seat, as the previous one did not meet its user standards. To sum up, house seats can be applications of contemporary digital uh, special issues in architectural discipline. It questions the role of the architect and the perception of architecture in general. It could be assumed that as one does not only suggest the detachment from previous architectural spatial conceptions, but he categorically produces a space that has different principles from that. The five issues regarding the production of architectural space will always be a matter of discussion and cost of revision of the parameters that characterize it because of the multiplicity of data and the relations of the day lab. Thank you. I am the year one director of the School of Architecture in London. And I submitted this paper together with my partner, Zadim Stor. Zadim is the deputy head for architecture at the London Metropolitan University in London as well. We're both academics, full time academics, but sort of doing a bit of architecture in the spare time and quite a lot actually lately. So, a whole range of projects and I want to end with one of them in a minute. The title of talk for the paper is Room Playing, Playing Room. And the main question for us, as it is for the last couple of days, is what is actually home for us? And as part of this exploration, I will try to talk about how the inhabitants, especially children, are engaged with architecture and how they identify with spaces. After this, I will present some of the references we use in our practice. And I'm last going to show you some of our, our more recent projects, or try to apply some of the research we've done onto an actual project. So bear with me for that. First, a house seen from the perspective of an architect, of course. Um, I'd like to start with architects don't build homes, they design houses, they just design instructions for somebody else to build the house. 
And first, a house is often not a home. A house is often a product of a very painful struggle. A painful struggle with clients, a painful struggle with builders, with the planning authorities, and so on. So we try constantly trying to fight lots of different fires in different areas. And as an artist, we often have this issue that we try to put our stamp on something, on our creation. And it's often a big problem actually to let go, handing over a building to a client who then stops in happiness. Of course, that is an image of the fountain head of the 1931 novel by Anne Brim. A house is most probably a home, seen from the perspective of an occupant, of an owner. Because a home for a client is very different than the, the house you actually design. And clients do funny things with houses. I mean, first of all, they move in, or the other. Um, then they're often inhabited, so they need the furniture in. And then they really make it there, so they put pictures up, which will have the proof of usually. And just, but interestingly, um, the top one, I mean, both of them, um, are as you've shown, the Colbacy building. We've seen a lot of the Colbacy buildings. The top one is 1922, built on the outskirts of Paris. The bottom one is what it is now. The owners adopted it a bit. They changed it a bit. Um, their requirements changed, so they put some additions on, and the roof was leaking. Flat roofs don't work anyway. It should work much better. Um, this is what it is today, and I, in this research, I came across quite a lot of them, actually. But all the people who do this, they never publish because they look like that, and it's just that interesting. Uh, but more interesting for us, a house is a home, but for children, it, it is actually a playground. It's an amazing playground. Um, and children have a very different way how they see a space, or something we call on What they take in, how they experience the space, is actually with all their senses. And that does actually include the team walls and handrails from our experience for our own children. But anyway. um, the, a way of learning for them, of understanding the world, is a through a build-up experience. And their state of being or living can only be understood through all the previous experiences they made. And it is quite, it's quite interesting how these experiences sort of are still influencing the way how we live nowadays as sort of grown-ups. How do we then transform a house into a home? And when does it start to become a home, actually? For us, the, the interesting thing is when it's a client, when they suddenly have this moment of identification, when they suddenly start bond with the structure. For some of them, it is, from our experience, uh, very pretty. They slept in it. It's theirs. Um, for others, it is, from our experience as well, sort of when they start with it, it doesn't smell the pain anymore. Um, or actually, it might be lots of just like the God for saying hanging off the pictures and these weird things on the wall, which we really don't approve of. So, that is sort of an ident identification of the structure through objects. But actually, the real identification happens usually through personal experience, when the, when the, when the building and the structure becomes some sort of an embodiment of memories. And children, interestingly, they make, make these experiments or these experiences much, much quicker. So how do we interact with the space? How do we interact? How do we build up memories? How do we make this identification? How do we encourage this identification with the structure? It's very difficult. Um, the first reference, that, um, which is actually quite important in our own work, is Bruno Minari, which must be, at least for us, maybe one of the most under underappreciated designer we know. He developed a whole series of what he called in the 1950s, useless machines and unreadable books, which we actually call essential in our exploration. In that is, 1950s, um, William Nara demonstrates how to fight conflict in an uncomfortable chair. How do you engage with an environment? But to us, what's actually more important is actually a series of unreadable books. In these unreadable books, there is actually no story, there's no text, it's just a series of shapes. And every time you sort of flip over, you create a different configuration of shapes, different colored surfaces. And it's then actually down to you to make up a story. And this making up of a story is actually just about everything that is in your head is sort of projecting to shapes in front of you, which is actually quite amazing. 
Of course, if you have any imagination left, just a problem sometimes. Um, 1960, 1980s, so he continues to watch children through some sort of all these weird television shows, which we see now in television, where sort of the heart attack and stuff like that. He, he's sort of the godfather of all that. I'm sure it didn't see that one coming. In the 1970s, he developed a whole series of what they call children play structures for domestic, domestic environments. Yeah, he sort of encouraged them to engage with the structure in a very different way to encourage creative play and learn at the same time. <coughs> but our main reference and inspiration must be busted in some of his short films from the silent movie area. He's definitely our architect hero. Um, and the building we will see later on, actually, as far as I found out in the that he designed and he also saw the building process that he was an architect. In this film, <coughs> called One Week from 1920s, he gets his present flat pack house, um, which he wants to build. These are the instructions to give the house a snappy appearance, put up the uh, Put it up according to the numbers on the boxes, but again, the bus keep things go slightly wrong. With a not so friendly suit of this white civil, here she is. I changed the numbers on the boxes. The house arrived in, and Buster gets a bit confused. But, and in the choice of the building, also the misfortunes happen. But nevertheless, Buster and Sybil persevere. They continue building it against all of they actually finish the house. <coughs> or at least what you could consider being a house. That is on that side, that is the house being finished. <laughs> and you could see how they sort of start interacting with the structure as they build it, they build up sort of personal memories of that. <coughs> Once it's finished, it's their house. So here, civil and bastard, they start bonding with the structure, with the building. And so no matter how it looks, you know, and how that would be fun. But again, they, they love it. You know seems their love to the house. But interestingly, um, for them it's completely normal at the end of the house through removing the wall panel because the front door ended up on the first floor. And the whole thing sort of doesn't work. But anyway, for them it's completely normal, which is amazing. And the top and it's not moving. Finally, ask them to move in and they throw a housewarming party for all their friends. They take possession of the house, which is not their home. That's just a short version of the whole thing. And there's a lot of other scenes in the bathroom and how they furnish the house and get the piano in through pulling out the wall. But, but again, and in the end, of course, being a silent movie, the whole thing gets destroyed while they try to move the house to a different side and actually they have a train going for the house. And that is pre CGI, they actually have a real train going for the house. But anyway. <coughs> the next talk. One is um, a film called The Scarecrow from 1920, where the whole opening scene is how Buster and Sir Roberts are sharing a one-room house filled with all sorts of wonderful, ingenious, and completely equally pointless inventions. Actually, let's see in a second. The bed, of course, doubles up as a piano, which you can play. The gramophone is turning into hot, and they start cooking. The bathtub turns over, emptying the water into a so she plays that pond on the outside, while on the inside being transformed into a nice sofa you can use. <coughs> and finally, after having their dinner, and you see the film, um, all the dishes are fixed to the, to the tabletop, and you just hang it on the wall and just, just hose the whole thing down. And once that is done, we sort of, sort of get another sort of pointless and tuneless invention. It can be turned over to to pick the maybe not so long but fashionable slogan what is the house of the month. <coughs> in the project we work in our studios, clients often ask us are uh, more willing to take risks in the children's spaces. Which is sort of funny enough something apparently clients talk to each other and they, they sort of find us when they have problems with children rooms. I don't know why and how but apparently they all talk about that. But again, when you design for children, you have sort of problems. You actually can't really discuss the design with them or drawings. They sort of don't understand, understand that. And you have to ask yourself actually, what is play? Because children spend a lot of time in their rooms. In fact, for our own children, play is often associated with toys or possessions. <coughs> but is 
space left for play nowadays. Because nowadays Dublin has a very limited space in our cities and even in our private domains, it's a place where it's large and quite small. And the surroundings are quite controlled and always, of course, health and safety to prevent any injuries. Again, from our own experience with some of our four children, we can tell you that they heal quite fast and they learn from their own more unsuccessful adventures. <coughs> but truth, do we see architecture like the goblin just as a machine to live in? The architecture is just not there to give us a comfortable life. <coughs> but even the goblin's unity in Marseille, when left alone, children are really exploring the architecture. Or maybe that guy, so hanging off the ledge of the unity, when unsupervised, is actually the young David Bell, one of the inventors of free running, and that was the moment he invented parkour, as it's known in France. Maybe that's the reason why parkour was in France, the Colosseum. Maybe that's not a reason for it. On that. But in the city, so the place much less, seems to be much, much less facilitated at the top of Dresden, New York, where the city becomes actually a playground. In this project by Van Hertzberg at the uh, Montessori School in Delft, <coughs> the building not just facilitates play by keeping the children warm and dry. Here, the building is actually an interactive structure. You know, children can play with, they have to readjust the structure. Mm -hmm. Reconfigure it. Or some other play sculptures, some art, artists providing structures that children can actually play with on the system. <coughs> or play specific to objects, like sort of interactive play toys, I want that object. Yeah. Or sometimes you just introduce play furniture into the existing environment, like Luigi mm -hmm. uh, Polani's um, this version. But the most exciting way to get to space, so the architecture is actually there to integrate into the or the play is integrated into the architecture to create some sort of a play scale. <coughs> but that was, of course, in better times in the 70s when the spirit was more, of a much more experimental image. Nowadays, you see some sort of examples of what sort of architecture suddenly becomes a much more playful. Some examples from, from Japan, the level of architects, where the building has some sort of whole secondary circulation of the children slides, and it's actually quite amazing to film about that. I mean, <coughs> I would just would like to quickly show you a project we were working on in the last couple of years, two years ago, as a, as a part of a wider refurbishment of a house in London. London, if you don't build houses, just refurbish old ones. There are many of them around. And the biggest challenge was that was one of these clients, one of these clients of fine farmers, because they struggled with space, but they had too many children, not enough space. And some of our had struggled to come up with some sort of solution how you could accommodate them. Selling wasn't an option. Um, instead of introducing a normal space, we decided to divide the space actually diagonally by giving children sort of a sense of space, not just to create them in small boxes. But at the same time, not just dividing them, actually connecting them as well as an interactive toy, which was actually their wardrobe, which spins around. And children are actually unable to manipulate the space, the play space. And there are a lot of different ways I can use it from total separation, the two boys, <coughs> to join play, they sometimes play together. And they could actually block the whole parent world out and block themselves into the yellow room, which was actually an interesting concept for them. Each space had a very distinct character reflected in the different colours the boys chose, the green room and the yellow room. But at the same time, it's of a creative niche full of flaps. I think about 35 flaps in the whole thing. Some of them open, some of them lead into the other room. So in this room, that is a room behind the wardrobe, minus the lion and the witch, of course. And it actually created a non-static play environment, which is quite amazing. And I'm sure Bust up would approve of the project. <laughs> um, but the, the amazing thing was how the boys took ownership of their spaces, how they actually moved in how uh, they used the spinning wardrobe, how uh, they started to play with it. And it's still used now by a different family. They sold it, commissioned, commissioned us to design it, the interior of the new house, so they still like it. 
But the house really quickly became their home. And finally, after the, the new owners, we spoke to them. I think he said something that, that um, he made the mistake of taking the children to the house viewing. And that was it. He had to buy the house to go to the park. And but interestingly, the, the video was published on some lots of websites and a Swiss website. The Swiss as a nation are very conscious about children being squashed to death in houses. The, the comments were hilarious. Hasn't happened yet. Um, I don't necessarily want to finish with any, any sort of resolutions or, 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 or answers or anything for questions in, that, in, in this paper or in, in this presentation. Because again, it's sort of a starting point for much bigger. Project. I just would like to start, end with a little bit short for mature. We don't stop playing because of growth, we grow because we stop playing. So maybe next time we put the hobby all this game. Thank you very much.
Can I can I ask some? Yeah, I'll read really, really like to. So what you said, I, I think it's very interesting what you said there, but interestingly, in uh, 2011, at the Venice Biennale, 2010, Venice Biennale, um, Rem Kulhaks, who was very famous, uh, one of his most famous uh, statements was, was context, that idea that the, the building came completely from the program, but he's reinvented himself as a contextualist. He talks about the idea that the form of the building is very much generated by the form of the context. And there is this sense and this growing movement within architecture based on contextualism, which actually is two generations old now, that uh, form does follow form. And there is that sense that um, it's not form follows function, but the form of the existing has a direct influence on the form of any interventions placed within the urban or built environment. So I'm but adding to your yeah. points. Yeah. The question becomes, do you complement the context you depicted? Yeah, well there is that sense of a conversation yeah. with it. Yeah. I would like to add something as well to Tom's presentation. I'm, I'm not sure if this is the same your university was open in our days. That's a that's a really weird thing that, that people build less and less, especially the teachers. You know, we are some of the people who actually build something in the bathroom. I mean, I had a school in the building, which is a weird thing suddenly. So, so any, any discussion you actually have in, in the crib is never about the building. And it's very difficult to, 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 bring, actually, to bring it back to the, to the thing in front of you as a building. How do you enter that? You know, what kind of special quality that does it have? And, and when you start that discussion, you often get looked at sort of, sort of a bit funny. Sort of, you're, actually, you're the artist on the panel. <laughs> and you're trying to bring it back to actually what the whole thing is about. And what, yeah. yeah, and what it should be about. But, but often it, it's almost that the architect gets completely taken out of the, out of the context of the university and gets just replaced by, by research about architecture, which is often about research about architects, why architects doing things, not realizing that that it's a really vicious circle you're suddenly or or a very dangerous vicious circle you're getting into by doing that. Because I, again, I mean people have problems just to discuss a thing in front of them as a house. <laughs> and I think back to your question about you know the modern era <coughs> overcorrecting. Yes. Yeah. Right? Because the modern era was so criticized for being all about the form and all about the aesthetic that I think we've overcorrected yeah. to the point where we've leaped over the object. Yeah. We're afraid to talk about the, we're, we're afraid to talk about the thing as the design. Yeah. I mean, we need to find a middle. We need to be somewhere. In the middle. It's actually, yeah. there is some, somehow we feel that there is there is no kudos, there's no there is no sense of it being research <coughs> important because it's called a building. Yes. Yeah. And building is a really really important word. Yeah. And there is that sense. Well, is it architecture? Is it a building? But uh, to design a building is very important and it's a very yeah. Thing to do well. it's, it's, it's so funny when, 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 when you get to a student and you ask him, how do you enter the building? Where do you enter? And they say, does it, does it have to be a building? Yeah, uh, oh. but, but I think it's just a really simple question. I, I enter, I want to go to the toilet. 80% of the students are failing that question completely. Uh. They actually don't know where to get to into the building. They actually don't know the way around. You know, which really yeah, because bizarre. they don't want to design a building. But, yeah, because they actually they don't want to design a building. Because otherwise they they put themselves under so much criticism, which is quite bizarre. Sorry, that went off. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if you were being involved. <laughs> <laughs> I turned it off now, sorry. Yeah, I had a, a quick, uh, quick question here. I, I enjoyed the panel very much, actually. An interesting complimentary presentation to all of you. And I guess I had a question and maybe comment for the bookends, uh, <laughs> Sally and Patrick, uh, and that is you both really presented a, a critique of the notion of play and children's play. In your case, Sally, uh, your son and his best friend were playing over the computer without uh, having to physically see each other face to face, but the screen time was substituting for the face time. And then in your presentation, Patrick, the fact that the kids could play within the architectural structure that you designed. Um, I guess my, my comment is that 
despite the fact that there's all sorts of literature that says that kids and adults alike need to be exposed to nature and sunshine and fresh air, and that's good for you, no question it is. But I think both of you have also uh, put together some work that, that perhaps is a critique of the argument, the traditional argument for families moving out to the suburbs, which is because they need to have a yard and they want that single family detached house because it's so important for the kids to play in the yard. I think what you're showing is it isn't necessarily that important for them to play in the yard. The fresh air is important, the sunshine is important, but you can also get that in the public spaces. And I think it's an argument that needs to be heard more often, that you can do some really interesting things. I guess I'm wondering too, could you even take it further? I mean, you look at your movable walls and things that kids can play with. What about the ceiling? What about uh, the floor? I mean, are there things that you can do that would be, you know, almost uh, like uh, animals in a zoo or something like that, where you could have kids really getting a lot of exercise within the house itself that you could design that would make the house sort of a gymnastic setting without the need to have to go outside? I mean, but interestingly, this is what we built. That wasn't necessarily what we presented to the client. Was what we presented to the client actually involved the third dimension and it had some sort of roof lanterns which went up and they could actually play on the on the on the roof of that. Um, uh, but it was, of course, rejected by the planning authorities because you saw it in an elevation. Nobody else would see it, but and they didn't actually understand that. So it had to be everything we did had to be accommodated within the fabric of the building. And um, to, to the other point, the children, as small as small they are, in this house, they were actually bigger than the yard they had behind the house. And actually, the yard was more or less reserved to the door. With that door had to be somewhere. <laughs> so the children had to actually play in, uh, in their rooms. But I mean, on the other hand, there was a park just across the road. And the children got some fresh air every day, as far as I know. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> um, what I think is brilliant about children, what we can learn from them, is they'll take any environment and they'll push it to its absolute limits. Yeah. Whether that's a play environment, whether that's an urban environment, or whether that's a, um, uh, using computers. They don't really care about how it's made, and what puts it together, and what it's constructed from. They just want to know what it can do, and how they can exploit what it can do. And I, I, I think you're right, yes, this mm -hmm. time, there's, you know, there's bikes and there's fresh air, but I mean, it's chucking it down with the rain now, and it's, and it's wet, and it's dark, you know, they're, they're not going to be outside. So, yeah, yes, I agree. Uh, hello, sorry. Um, I would have a question for Svenja and Patrick, again, kind of in the lines of what you already said, but um, seeing that uh, both your presentations see the way that uh, kids inhabit space, the space of a home or the virtual extended space of a home. I was, um, I had this thought uh, uh, to Pinar as well, I think the, the question would be a bit, if filming kids interacted with architecture could be actually a tool to criticize the ar architecture itself. Um, yeah, I think so. Or the space itself, in case of a virtual to just see the way it works and without saying any words, just filming a kid interact with it, I think would say more than architects words. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. 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 I think it was really refreshing. The thing that I found really interesting was the kind of close observation of the way homes are actually being occupied at the moment. Um, it's something I've been working with, with students and other people uh, uh, to engage with. For, uh, and, and we, in, in the sense that we, we, there isn't quite enough questioning of the way that the home is being used in a modern way. For instance, I mean, we continue to build bathrooms apart from yours, which is now migrated to bedroom in your hotel. But we continue to make them as some sort of strange kind of hygienic space with a basin, a toilet, a shower and things. When in fact, they could well become now the sort of beautification where you're doing your Botox and all the other things that go with body transformations. So we're not really, we've not really understood that they're actually changing. And I think the thing that was going through my mind is that, that 
operating now in Australia, I see many, many new houses that win awards. And the planning of them seems to...